Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Fem TV. Today we visit with musical artist Jamie Anderson. Jamie Anderson is a singer, songwriter, and performer from Tucson, Arizona. She's been playing the guitar since she was 15. She's been performing publicly since the late 80s, and she's been touring nationally since 1987. In 1989, she released her debut album, Closer to Home. And in 1992, she released her second album, Center of Balance. With her partner of five years, she manages her own record company, Tsunami Records. Anderson's musical style is described as progressive folk and includes country, blues, rock, and bluegrass with a heavy dose of comedy. Jamie Anderson was in Houston February 12th for a concert at the University of Houston produced by Planet Earth Productions. And now my breasts will sing a number. <laughs> my song of condolence for heterosexuals. <laughs> Would the straight people like to come out? Please. <laughs> Only two will admit it, huh? <laughs> I always ask that at my concerts so that uh, straight folks can sort of get a taste of what it's like to have to make that decision. Should I raise my hand or not? I played in um, Tucson 
last week, which is where I'm from, my family was in the audience, and when I asked that question, they did not raise their hands. <laughs> I said, Mom? <laughs> well, how many of you are having a bad hair day? <laughs> that was really enthusiastic. <laughs> well, finally, darling, you're going to get support for what you're going through today. And Perhaps the rest of you will remember the last time you had a bad hair day. This is about when I had one.
I read a lot, and um, I came upon this very interesting article. I got it from Glamour magazine. I don't usually read Glamour, <laughs> really. <laughs> and, uh, and the article is called, Not Just Another Prom Night. And it's the story of Heidi and Missy, who went to their high school prom together. Now, this didn't happen in New York City or San Francisco. This happened in Manassas, Virginia. <laughs> so this article shows them picking out their tuxedos, black with lavender cummerbunds. And uh, they met on the basketball team, by the way. One of them was the captain. <laughs> Anyway, it talks about them getting ready for it. And, and uh, of course, as word got around school that they were doing this, you know, they, they did run into a little bit of trouble. Uh, one day as Heidi was leaving school, somebody yelled out, Dyke. And she turned around and she said, yeah, I'm proud of it. <laughs> 15, she's 15. So finally, the, the big night comes and they walk hand in hand to the gym. And uh, a teacher that Missy had known years earlier came over and kissed her, saying, we're behind you 100%. And uh, they went over and they sat down and they were watching the dancers. And Heidi, Missy said, we're making history sitting here on our butts. <laughs> you know, we singer-songwriters are a pretty egotistical bunch. You know, we run around singing songs about ourselves all the time. And I thought I would do something different and write a song from someone else's point of view. So that's what this next song is. Of course, it's still in the first person because I'm lazy. It's called At Karen's House.
So it is Valentine's Day weekend, so I guess I'd better do a mush song here. You know, and if your sweetie isn't with you, or if you don't have a particular sweetie right now, there is importance in self-love. <laughs> perhaps I shouldn't say that before I do a song like this. this it's, um, it's called Dark Chocolate. And what better thing to give on Valentine's Day, huh? <laughs>
fans of country music. Eh, eh, there's a few half hands. <laughs> oh God, if I have to. If my girlfriend has it on, all right, all right. Uh, I, I like a lot of country music. In fact, um, there's one particular artist that really butters my bread. So I wrote a song about her. It's not who you think it is. <laughs> it's someone who might be mad at me if she knew about this song. And uh, <laughs> it's called Winona, Why Not? Here's something I got from Rolling Stone. I will admit to reading that once in a while. There's a side of me that wants to be good, said Winona Judd. But there's another side that's a little bit of a rebel. I always believed it was right to go to church, but sometimes I have this overwhelming urge to ride my Harley up and down the aisles. I say, right on, sister. <laughs> 
And you know that last verse about Democrat and Republican, she was one of the few artists to sing in support of the Republicans last year. I know, and still, that's how love is, you know? <laughs> it is Valentine's Day, you know? We're close to it. Uh, so this is something I got from Life Magazine. Speaking of Harleys. Jennifer Fattel of Hillsbury, North Dakota, got married for the second time, but her husband didn't like her Harley. So she sold it. Then she got divorced, and she put an ad in the paper. It said, she'd like to trade her engagement ring, wedding dress, and veil for a good Harley. <laughs> I just want a bike, she explained. No men. <laughs> I wonder if she knows Winona. <laughs> Here's something I got from the Wall Street Journal. I don't read that either. Uh, about country music. It says, a study of 49 metropolitan areas finds the greater the radio airtime devoted locally to country music, the higher the white suicide rate. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, you next time you're threatened, you don't need a gun, just turn on Buck Owens, you know? My, my, my poor guitar, last weekend I played at home in Tucson. Weekend before I played in Alaska. When I left Fairbanks, it was 58 below. But it was a dry cold. But I tell you, it was wonderful playing up there, you know? Cold climate, warm hearts. Mm. If you ever get a chance to visit, do that. This next song is a brand new one. It's called Someday. <laughs> Thank you. 
you put a lot of energy into performing. When did you know this is what you wanted to do with your life? When I leapt out of the womb. <laughs> <laughs> That early. <laughs> I, oh, you know, I was always singing and dancing and doing something when I was a kid to attract attention, so, you know, it's only natural that I progress to where I am. Um, I picked up the guitar in high school, and that's when I started doing music publicly, really. I understand your dad was a guitar player? Yeah, okay. my dad's a country musician. He played in a band for many years. So I grew up hearing uh, live country music around the house. And that also meant that there were a lot of guitars around the house so that I could pick one up and teach myself to play. What are some of the influences that led you to a career in women's music? Well, I was listening to women's music. Um, I discovered it in about the late 70s, and I'd only been playing guitar for a couple of years, so you know, it only made sense that that's the kind of music that I would choose to play. And also, I'm a lesbian feminist, and I thought that that was a, a good way to express who I was. It, it would be a lie for me to sing generic love songs. It just wouldn't work for me. You and your partner established Tsunami Records and you produce your own albums. Tell me about the record company. What did it take to start that business? <laughs> Complete ignorance. <laughs> because, I mean, if we had any idea of what we were really getting into, I'm not sure we would have done it because it's a heck of a lot of work and uh, for not a whole lot of money. I mean, uh, I think the Small Business Administration says that it takes like three years for a small business to get off the ground. You know, you're not supposed to do anything but break even at the best during those three years. Well, you know, if you start a record company, multiply that because it's a, it's a really hard business to make any money at. But um, it's a really fun and interesting business. And um, I think that we've learned a whole lot along the way and we're, we're getting better at what we do. Did you establish, establish Tsunami so you could produce your own albums, and are you going to continue doing that exclusively or produce other people? I established Tsunami to produce my own albums, yeah. Um, I needed an outlet. I knew that Warner Brothers probably wasn't going to be interested in what I did. I'm a little too radical for them. And um, I also wanted control, so um, that's why we started Tsunami. Um, up until now, it has been just my work. We have two albums out. Um, we, I, um, Closer to Home and Center of Balance. And then a new one will be coming out in April, and it's a sampler of women's music. And it will contain selections from uh, either 13 or 14 different artists. Each one have contributed a song. So we're sort of branching out there and uh, starting to feature other artists. Arizona artists, or where, where are they from? Oh, they're national. Um, Alex Dobkin is going to be on it, June Millington, Venus Envy, a lot of women that I know from women's music festivals and just from the circuit. You've been listening to and making women's music for probably 15 years now. What do you think about the status of women's music today? What's good about it is that it's it's strong in a lot of respects and it still exists. I mean, a lot of people predicted the end of women's music back a few years ago. Um, I, I guess that was around the time that uh, the mainstream media was predicting the end of feminism, and I, I guess people sort of felt like it would hand in hand. It really has changed. Um, the audiences aren't as big as they were um, in the heyday, you know, back in the late 70s or early 80s. Um, but I think what, what could be changed right now in women's music is a larger appeal to younger women. We're really missing women in their 20s and even younger. And um, I see some hope with bands like Girls in the Nose and uh, some of the gorilla rock that I've been seeing around. I think that's great. But, you know, that kind of stuff hasn't really seeped into um, women's festivals yet. You don't really see that kind of work usually at women's concerts yet. And I think that that really needs to be addressed and worked on. I like that some women's music is still strongly lesbian identified since I'm a lesbian that's real important to me. Um, and I like that there's still a network available for us to, uh, to travel in and to do concerts in and to validate and support one another. I understand you performed at nine festivals in 1992. What do you like about the festival circuit? Oh, I love festivals. I just, I love being around all that woman energy. And uh, I'm a music junkie. You know, you usually find me at the stage, you know, transfixed with whoever's up on stage. Well, not always transfixed, but, you know, enjoying whatever's going on. I like the networking. Um, they're just really fun places to be. And as a musician, it's, um, they're really good for me to be at because it's a good way for me to gain exposure to a large amount of women who um, maybe hadn't heard me before.
You played at the Lone Star Women's Music Festival for the first time in October 1992. Do you have any impressions about that particular event? <laughs> Texas women are pretty wild. That's, that's <laughs> and, um, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that festival, and um, I thought there's a real good variety of entertainment there. Um, I loved hanging out with the performers, and I loved meeting the women who uh, came to the festival to hear us. It was just um, a blast. Uh, there's sort of a Oh, hat. It's sort of a, a wild spirit, you know, in Texas women that I don't see at a, a lot of the festivals that I go to. You know, some of the festivals I go to, believe it or not, I'm just a little reserved and everybody's sort of watching everybody else to make sure, you know, everything's okay. But in Texas women are like, eh, pff, hey, let's have a good time. Who's on next, you know? So it's kind of, they, they kind of remind me of um, Alaska women. I went to Alaska a couple of weeks ago and same kind of hearty individuals, you know, are from up there. Whose work do you find interesting today? Who are you listening to? Oh, let's see. I really like um, Tracy Chapman, and um, I like the Indigo Girls. I love Melissa Etheridge. In women's music, I'm a big fan of Deirdre McCullough's. I think she's a fine songwriter and a really nice woman. I finally got to meet her a couple of months ago. We did some recording together. Um, I'm also a big fan of Meg Christians. She's not really performing anymore, but uh, I, I just thought she was the best. What about in literature or film? Do you keep up with those areas at all? Oh, yeah, I'm a readaholic. I, I read everything I get my hands on. You know, some of it's trash and some of it isn't. Um, um, one of my favorite authors is Jane Rule, who wrote um, Desert Hearts. And although that wasn't the title of the book, but... Desert of the Heart. Desert of the Heart, I knew, yeah, something like that. It's been a while since I've read that particular book, but I've read all of her books. I love Rita Mae Brown. I think she's hysterical. I'm also a big mystery fan. I've read everything that Sue Grafton and Sarah Paretsky have ever written. And uh, mysteries are great for me to read when I'm on tour, when I, you know, can't really concentrate on any, any heavy intellectual novel. That's when I pull out the Sarah Paretsky. I mean, that's great stuff. You were born and raised in Arizona, and you currently live in Tucson. Tell me about life there. <laughs> life in Tucson by Jamie Anderson. <laughs> hmm. uh, Tucson's a wonderful city. It's kind of the liberal pocket of Arizona. All the Republicans live in Phoenix, and we like them there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real creative place. A lot of um, artists live there. Um, at one time, in terms of artists per capita, Tucson was ninth in the nation. Um, artists tell me that they like the light there. Uh, and it's just sort of an, uh, an aura of creativity there. Um, and also, it's in a beautiful part of the desert. We're surrounded on four sides by mountain ranges, very high mountains that uh, sometimes turn colors with the day. I mean, sometimes they're a glorious magenta, and sometimes they turn purple and blue. And, um, and it's desert there, but it's, uh, it's kind of lush for a desert. It's kind of a high desert with a lot of vegetation. and. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful place to live. There's a great women's community there, real varied, and always lots of stuff going on. I just, I love living there. You mentioned Girl Scouting in some of your songs. What did you get out <laughs> of that experience? Well, I found women's community really early. <laughs> um, I found strength in Girl Scouting. It was real important to me. When a lot of my friends were... Uh, you know, learning to put on makeup and talking about boys and, you know, following their mothers around the kitchen, I was out hiking with the Girl Scouts. And that's why I, I can't put on makeup today because <laughs> I missed that part of, but it's okay, it's a small price to pay. It's not even a price to pay, I shouldn't even phrase it that way. But um, uh, it just, it helped me to uh, recognize the strength of women and to learn that we can do for each other without having men telling us what to do. Did you go to some of the Girl Scout camps where you were surrounded by nothing but women for mm -hmm. several weeks at a time? Yeah, it's just sort of like a women's music festival, only you're camping. And there's a little less music, but there's still a lot of it. Tell me a little about your adolescence. What were you like in high school? <laughs> I can't believe you're asking me this. I was a nerd in high school. I was a... Well, you know, anybody who was a Girl Scout in high school has to be a nerd. I mean, there's just no way around that. <laughs> but all of the, the world's great intellectuals were nerds in high school, so I, I take um, comfort in that. Um, what was I like in high school? I was pretty quiet, which is hard for a lot of people to believe, and uh, kept to myself a lot. 
uh, read a lot, played a lot of music, you know, stuff like that. You know, most of my close friends were women. In addition to making music, you've written articles for Hotwire magazine. You've gone back to school for a business degree. You have a radio broadcaster's license. What kind of projects are you involved in outside of music? Well, I think you've just about named them all. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a broadcaster at a community radio station, which is a volunteer position, and uh, we play a lot of eclectic music there, and I love it um, because I can play anything that's in the control room, and we have a very eclectic mix. I mean, I can play Tracy Chapman, followed by African dance music, followed by bluegrass, followed by Alex Dobkin if I want to, and um, it's, it's really a lot of fun. When I'm relaxing, I usually just uh, watch reruns of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> oh, I know. I have a little better taste. I watch Murphy Brown, I guess is one of my more favorite TV shows. I do bead work too. I make earrings and stuff like that. I made these earrings. Interesting. The show on community radio, is that a is that your show? No. Is no, um I'm on tour about five or six months of the year, so I'm not in town long enough to do my own show. So what I do is I'm a um, I'm an official substitute and people call me up to fill in for their shifts. Um during the week, what mostly we have at the radio station are um, just music mixes where they just play all kinds of music. They aren't specific shows. And so generally when I'm substituting for someone, it's for one of those shows. Do you have any specific plans for the future? Well, right now I'm working on getting um, the compilation recording out. The deadlines are right on top of me now. In fact, i, I got to go home after this and uh, finish work up on that. Um, for me, mostly, it's, you know, putting one foot in front of the other. You know, I'll be doing another album of just my own work um, probably the next year or two. And uh, besides that, I don't really have any definite plans except just to keep doing what I'm doing and uh, hopefully to play to bigger audiences in more places. Tell us a little more about the compilation. What is it titled? Um, it's called A Family of Friends. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, it'll be 13 or 14 different artists, um, all kinds of music. I mean, we've got everything from a reggae tune from June Millington to um, a world beat tune from Kay Gardner and uh, Nuru. I would say her last name, but I can't pronounce it yet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, the title song, A Family of Friends, was co-written by uh, a variety of women, including Sue Fink and June Millington and myself. And um, several of us recorded it all together in uh, California at June's studio in November. And we decided just to invite everybody that we knew who lived in the Bay Area to join us on it. So we have a really great group that recorded this song. Um, I, I, I probably can't remember all the names. Um, Deirdre McCullough, Margie Adam, Robin Flower, Helen Hook. Helen used to be with the Deadly Nightshade, um, one of the first women's bands to be signed by a mainstream label in the 70s, and she's still making music, and she happened to be in the area, so she's on it. Uh, Sharon Washington of the Washington Sisters was there. Barbara Borden played drums, who's played, who used to be with the live. Um, Mary Watkins played keyboards. I mean, it was just um, a really exciting thing to put together, and, and the finished product is something that we're all really proud of, and of course, that's going to open the whole thing. Um, the cover of it is a painting, also titled A Family Friends, that we commissioned with um, a local painter. It's a really beautiful work that was like finished two days ago. We're waiting for the paint to dry so the graphic artists can have at it. Um, it'll be released in late April. We're hoping to get it out in time for the National March on Washington, which is April 25th. That's sort of our, uh, our goal. And it'll be available wherever women's music is sold. And uh, that means different places according to the city, um, always in women's bookstores and gay bookstores, but there are some uh, alternative record stores that will carry it.